Thank you for the invitation to join the At the Limits 2021 MS conference. I wish I was able to be there in person with all of you in London and hope to be able to come visit sometime very soon. I'll be presenting on the effect of biological age on disease progression. I have no disclosures related to the content of this presentation and my original work was supported by the National MS Society. As an overview, I'll summarize patterns related to chronological age in MS with respect to relapses and non-relapse related progression. I'll distinguish biological from chronological age and provide evidence that progressive MS is an aging related disease. The phenotype of multiple sclerosis during childhood is notable for the fact that there's virtually no progressive disease. From the literature, there's less than one or just under 1% of patients with pediatric MS present with primary progressive MS. And in my clinical experience, I can't think of a patient that I've seen present with primary progressive MS. If patients came in looking like progressive disease, they just needed more aggressive therapy for relapsing disease. There is a higher annualized relapse rate in pediatric MS compared to adults. In the Boston group, Mark Gorman's paper from 2009, the annualized relapse rate in the pediatric MS cohort from Boston Children's Hospital was about 1.1 compared to 0.4 in the adult Harvard Partners program. In recent clinical trials, this difference in relapse rate appears to be even greater. With the baseline data from the pivotal first trial in pediatric MS for Gelenia, the baseline annualized relapse rate was two relapses per year compared to the 0.4 annualized relapse rate in most of the placebo arms from recent adult, adult clinical trials. To continue this uh, description of relapse rate as a function of age, I'll turn to a paper by Juta Gartner looking at intermediate ages of youth from the 18 to 30 year old age range. In a sub-analysis from the original pivotal fingolimod trials, the 18 to 20 year old annualized relapse rate in the placebo arms of the two Gelenia trials were 0.74 and 0.6. The 20, 30 year olds, even more intermediate, 0.57 and 0.48. And in the total population in these original trials, 75% of whom were over age 30, annualized relapse rates were 0.4 and 0.33. If we put together the data from the prior slide and this slide, we can see that there's a gradation of annualized relapse rate from children through young adults and to older adults living with multiple sclerosis. Helen Tremlett published on the British Columbia database looking at relapse rate as a function of age and time. In over 2,500 patients with up to 12,000 post-onset relapses, all of which were captured before 2003 while we were still mainly using inject injectable medications, there was a 17% decrease in relapse rate for every five years of disease duration. But there were much greater decreases in this relapse rate in older patients. This is depicted in two ways at the bottom of the slide. On the left um, with the original graphic from Helen Tremlett's paper and on the right with an even more simplified tabular form. In the graph on the y-axis is the percent change in relapse rate with the negative values be meaning a decline in the annualized relapse rate. And on the x-axis are five-year epochs of time of disease duration, but stratified into four age groups. Those with onset before age 20, those with onset 20 to 30, 30 to 40, and greater than 40. And what you can see for all groups is that relapse rates decline over disease duration, but they decline much faster for older patients. In the tabular form on the right-hand side, you can see for those under 20 at the time of MS onset, it's only about a 7% decrease in annualized relapse rate over five years. But in the bottom of the table, those over 40, there's an up to 30% decline in relapse rate over just the first five years of disease duration. Age, chronological age is also a factor in the accumulation of disability. If you are older at the time your MS starts, you have a shorter time to disability milestones and the need for walking assistance. And that's even independent of disease duration. For example, if you are a pediatric MS patient with onset around the age of 10, secondary progressive MS may occur in 20 to 30 years. If your MS, on the other hand, starts closer to age 40, 45, secondary progressive MS features may begin to show up within just five or 10 years. Notably, the mean age of onset of both secondary and primary progressive MS is around 45, which is compared to relapsing remitting MS, which is around 30. 
So is biological a aging a driver of progressive MS? This is a very simple graphic from Timmins et al. for all ages, uh, for all uh, aging related diseases, but can apply also to thinking about progressive MS. If we can separate out the trajectories through biological aging markers of those who are rapid agers and those who are aging more slowly, we might be able to determine the underpinnings of the relationship of age to the development of diseases like progressive MS. What is biological aging? It means that birth date isn't everything. Large cohort studies, even some from the UK, as well as the United States and Haines study, tell us that for a large group of individuals with the same chronological age, for example, a large group of 38-year-olds, their biological age could range from 25 to 60, 10 to 15 years in either direction. Many factors contribute to this biological aging variability. Genetics, for one thing. Level of exercise, the only known fountain of youth. <clears throat> toxins like smoking or if people had exposure to chemotherapies early in life, environmental and other forms of biological stress can also rapidly advance biological aging. Biological age appears relevant for chronic diseases like heart disease, even diabetes, even cancer risk, and biological age can predict time of mortality. Both, there are both somatic and reproductive types of biological aging markers. I'll start with a review of some data on somatic aging in men and women living with MS. One might say that the ultimate biological clock is telomere length. Telomeres are caps of proteins and nucleotide repeats that protect the ends of chromosomes and shorten with each cell division. Telomere shortening can be accelerated, however, by oxidative stress, DNA damage, other environmental factors, and can portray biological risk for more rapid aging. Shortened telomeres have been seen and associated with cardiovascular disease, dementia, autoimmune diseases that tend to have second peaks in the fifth, sixth, seventh decades of life, like lupus and rheumatoid arthritis. And prior to our own work, there was a pilot study showing that leukocyte telomere length was shorter in patients with progressive MS compared to those with relapsing MS. So we asked the question, is biological aging, as measured by leukocyte telomere length, associated with clinical disability and brain volume in MS, independent of chronological age and disease duration? I want to make a few notes on measuring leukocyte telomeres. Um, one is that leukocyte telomeres are accessible, readily accessible with blood samples, but they're thought to be a good biomarker for all cell type telomeres, including in the CNS. There are different me methods of measuring telomere length, and it's important to note that terminal restriction fragmentation, uh, where you digest the rest of the somatic DNA and just leave the telomeric DNA and run it out on a gel, uh, requires a significant amount of DNA, but can be compared across studies, but can lead to overestimation of leukocyte telomere length. On the other hand, real-time PCR methods, such as qPCR, uh, require a lot less DNA, but may be very sensitive to the DNA quality. So it's important to look at what measures been made when you're evaluating a study of telomere length. Our model for why we're interested in measuring leukocyte telomere length in MS is that there are a variety of factors that drive telomere attrition, including oxidative stress, cell replication, the level of telomerase in that particular cell type, genetic predisposition, and that when you experience that telomere attrition, even just a few chromosomes having telomere attrition in a cell can drive the DNA damage response and the senescence processes and for cells to start uh, uh, secreting pro-inflammatory factors, which are likely very relevant in autoimmune disease like MS. But we're also using LTL as a marker of senescence processes that might not be happening in lymphocytes, but other cell types in the body, such as telomere attrition in microglia and resident CNS cells, all of this driving MS disability. These are the baseline characteristics of the UCSF EPIC cohort in which we studied leukocyte telomere length. You can see that the mean age of these individuals was around 33, 43, uh, a perfect age to study the effects of aging with plenty of patients in the younger age groups and those older than 40 as well. You can see the pattern of MS subtype that was included in this cohort. Like many cohorts, the predominant phenotype was relapsing MS. And importantly, at the bottom of the slide, the mean telomere length at baseline in this cohort was 0.97, as expressed as a telomere to somatic DNA ratio, or a TS ratio. This is exactly what we would expect for a cohort of healthy individuals um, in this age range as well. 
Our methods for this analysis were to perform a cohort study measuring leukocyte telomere length at baseline in this cohort that had already collected clinical and imaging data. We also completed a nested case control study looking at 23 individuals who progressed over the 10 years of follow-up in the EPIC study to secondary progressive MS and matching them to those who stayed as relapsing remitting MS. And we matched them on key characteristics of age, sex, disease duration, and baseline EDSS. Here's our primary baseline cross-sectional analysis results. We have both the unadjusted and adjusted model results here. The notable statistically significant results are highlighted in bold on the top row, disability score based on the EDSS. And we see in the adjusted column on the right, a beta coefficient of 0.27 higher EDSS score if a patient experienced a 0.2-fold reduction in telomere length or had a 0.2-fold lower telomere length. It was highly statistically significant, and this coefficient is clinically relevant if you compare it to other time-based variables in MS analyses. We also had clinically relevant and statistically significant results for total brain volume and total white matter volume. And these adjusted results were adjusted for chronological age and disease duration. We also wanted to look through mediation analysis about how much of the effect of chronological age might pass through a leukocyte telomere-based pathway. So I take you through the three steps of this mediation analysis and these three bullet points. As expected, for every 10-year increase in chronological age, the expanded disability status scale score was 0.51 units higher and highly statistically significant. In the second step, we looked at the direct effect of chronological age on EDSS that wasn't mediated by leukocyte telomere length by adjusting for leukocyte telomere length. That diminished the coefficient for the effect of chronological age to 0.43 units of the EDSS scale. And then finally, we can assess the indirect effect then of age on EDSS that's mediated by leukocyte telomere length. And this was calculated to be 15%. In that longitudinal analysis of the nested case control study, comparing those who went on to form secondary progressive MS versus those who stayed as relapsing remitting MS, we see the primary results here. And the key result is in bold at the top of the table. Again, unadjusted, adjusted results. The adjusted results were uh, adjusted for chronological age, disease duration, and body mass index. And we still see a clinically relevant beta coefficient of a higher disability score if a patient experienced over that 10 years of follow-up a 0.2-fold decline in the TS ratio of the leukocyte telomere length. And it was highly statistically significant. We also had relevant coefficients for some of the other outcomes, including the imaging. Um, but the didn't reach statistical significance, likely due to the small sample size. So in summary, uh, telomere attrition in MS in our study was explained 15% of the variance of the effect of chrono chronological age on disability. Shorter telomere length, independent of disease duration and chrono chronological age, was strongly associated with higher disability levels in both cross-sectional and longitudinal analysis. Aging-related processes may contribute to MS progression. Oxidative stress, decline in remyelination capacity, altered immune function, all may be potential mechanisms of, of, of a potential causal association. Comorbidities and lifestyle factors may also contribute. Telomere attrition is also driving cardiovascular disease, disease within uh, blood vessels and the heart, and so we have to consider these factors when we look at aging studies as well. And finally, targeting aging-related processes may be a key therapeutic strategy for MS progression. Putting our work in context, there have been over the last two years a few additional papers published on telomeres and, M and MS. Going back to the pilot study that preceded our work, Guan et al. in 2015, uh, showed that primary progressive MS patients have the shortest LTL compared to healthy controls and relapsing patients. Redondo et al. in 2018 found that progressive MS patient mesenchymal stromal cells displayed accelerated telomere restriction fragment shortening in vitro. Habib et al. in 2020 demonstrated shorter leukocyte telomere length in progressive MS versus relapsing remitting patients. And different from our cohort, 
Um, they found that leukocyte telomere length may be shorter in MS patients compared to control, healthy controls. We didn't see that in our larger study, but there were some differences in the two populations and a few differences in the methodology in those works. Hecker et al. in 2021 studied 40 relapsing remitting patients, 20 primary progressive patients, and showed that there was a higher risk for conversion to secondary progressive MS over 10 years in those relapsing patients who had lower leukocyte telomere levels at baseline. So trying to put this together into a model that might lead to a biological mechanism that's relevant for progressive MS. I have a, a fairly simple schematic of what I think are the key points in thinking about somatic aging processes and MS, at least in the, in the peripheral compartment. On the left-hand side, we have the youthful state with normal length telomeres, very few senescent cells, healthy cells, and possibly less disability in an MS patient. And then with cell division, oxidative stress, possibly even effects of MS itself, there is telomere attrition over time. And as those telomeres uh, shorten, even just a few telomeres shortening within a cell could trigger the DNA damage response, the creation of a senescent cell that is no longer able to replicate, no, no longer able to mount the type of immune responses we, we tend to see in typical MS relapses, but instead enters a state of chronic inflammation that might be escaping the regulatory responses that we see in immune responses in earlier stages of MS. And there is secretion of lots of pro-inflammatory cytokines and other molecules. As these senescent cells accumulate over time, this may be driving the chronic inflammation that leads to the phenotype of, of accumulated disability in multiple sclerosis and what we describe as the progressive phenotype. Uh, what we're able to measure here might be limited to the peripheral compartment and lymphocytes, leukocytes. However, we, as we assume based on leukocyte telomere length's ability to reflect telomere shortening and other cell types, that this might be happening in parallel with similar processes and resident CNS cells in the brain, such as uh, senescent microglia that might be promoting locally pro-inflammatory environments in the brains of people with MS. What's exciting is that outside the field of MS, there's a lot of work developing what are called senolytic therapies, therapies that can modulate these cells or maybe even remove these cells and change that aging environment. And I think this is really exciting work that needs to be considered as we approach better treatments for progressive MS. Now there's a competitor for telomere length. There's a uh, exciting uh, body of data growing on epigenetic biological clocks. Uh, looking at DNA methylation patterns is a mar marker of biological age. And these patterns and the DNA methylation uh, patterns in cells um, has been shown to predict mortality and comorbidity in longitudinal cohorts such as the US and Haines study. In MS, we're at an early stage but intriguing stage of evidence looking at epigenetic called phenoage, uh, is an epigenetic clock name, might be accelerated in MS patients compared to controls. And phenoage was also shown across cell to, to differ across cell types and between sexes in MS patients. We're at an early stage also of a proof of principle a set of studies looking at how to reverse epigenetic age. So like uh, intervening on senescent cells, there might be an opportunity to intervene on aging as per this epigenetic clock. So what about the chicken or the egg question? Is the reason we're measuring some of these things in MS patients because aging is driving this phenotype in MS or is MS itself also driving the aging process? Both could certainly be happening in parallel. Overall, it's not clear. Disease duration and aging are very tightly coupled. And when we look at statist uh, statistical analyses that involve all of these time variables, we have to take great care um, that we don't get collinear effects in our models. Repeated clonal expansion events in the lymphocyte compartments could certainly be driving senescence of B cells and T cells. Epigenetic aging, the early evidence we have, suggests there might be accelerated aging in MS. The leukocyte telomere results are conflicting. We did not see accelerated telomere attrition by disease state in our, our large EPIC cohort. However, some of the newer studies are suggesting perhaps in some relapsing patients there may be evidence of accelerated aging. Some DMT mechanisms of action could contribute or confound measurement. We don't fully understand how lymphocyte depleting or sequestering agents may be impacting our measurements or some of these processes themselves. 
So here I've, I've tried to make a grand picture of different effects of aging and how they could impact someone living with multiple sclerosis. In most of this talk, we focused on the left-hand side with telomere attrition, driving of senescence pathways, secretion of the senescence-associated secretory proteins that lead to a inflammaging, chronic inflammation state happening in the periphery. But we know there's also stress coming from energy sources and mitochondrial dysfunction. And we know and hope that what we're measuring in the periphery with leukocyte telomere attrition and senescence might be paralleling what's happening with senescence telomere attrition in resident CNS cells like astrocytes and OPCs. But we know all of these aging processes are also having effects on other organs, on the cardiovascular system, on insulin resistance, and that those secondary problems and comorbidities are compounding the problem, creating white matter lesions in the brain. Even normal appearing white matter has changes in their structure related to aging and exacerbated by these comorbidities, and we have to take that into account as well. We've come to appreciate the role of the microbiota, gut microbiota and MS risk. But one thing we might uh, be forgetting is that with age, the gut becomes more leaky and there's more translocation of the bacteria and stimulation of the immune system. And that may be playing a role as well. And then in the bottom left corner, I wanna take a few slides also to review the potential impact of reproductive aging in both women and men. So we'll talk about ovarian function and testosterone levels with respect to MS progression. But quickly, a review of sex differences in MS. While women are more likely and girls are more likely to have MS, the overall sex ratio is three to one, males may have worse or earlier progression. Females tend to have more relapses and inflammation, but they catch up after menopause with men. Sex hormones are implicated in risk and phenotype. The gender ratio before puberty and after menopause, after 50, is one to one. Pregnancy reduces disease activity and estrogens decrease severity in mouse models. Low testosterone increases MS risk and severity in men in some animal models. So what is the hypothesis between ovarian aging and MS? What's the evidence to support pursuing this hypothesis? Well, conspicuously, the mean age of onset of both primary and secondary progressive MS are around 45 years of age. The mean age of menopause in most developed countries is around 51. But most of the interesting biology in perimenopause happens long before the last menstrual cycle. Most of the fluctuations in biological levels of sex steroid hormones and other factors related to ovarian and hypothalamic function happen many years earlier. And there's a 10-year period of decline of ovarian, ovarian function, mostly happening in the 40s for women. And it is notable that women catch up to men in disability levels after menopause at 50. So does ovarian aging contribute to the development of progressive MS in women? Well, there are multiple ways to measure ovarian aging. You can look at self-report when women say they had their last menstrual cycle. But obviously there are issues with that, with self-report, with memory, and also with what I just said, there's a lot of interesting biology that happens for 10 years before that, that last menstrual cycle. We can look at estrogen and FSH, but those are incredibly menstrual cycle dependent. So you would have to carefully plan your measurements for certain times in the cycle. And it can be very difficult to do that type of analysis if you're dealing with a stored uh, data bank or a biorepository. So we looked at using anti-Mullerian hormone. It's secreted by the granulosa cells in the antral follicles and, and females in the ovary. It lowers gradually over the course of an adult woman's lifetime as depicted on the right-hand exponential graph. And it explains 82% of the variability of the age of menopause. And it lets us look at that early perimenopausal period. And it helps separate biological and chronological age for women. And it's become a surrogate for ovarian reserve and fertility clinics. So I've summarized our paper um, here uh, for you in terms of disability and AMH level. So if you look at a twofold lower anti-malarian hormone level, which is a fairly modest decrease, it was associated with higher EDSS and highly statistically significant in cross-sectional analysis. The beta coefficient of 0.13 may not sound impressive, but compared to a 0.48 higher EDSS for every year disease duration, it's threefold higher. We also looked at longitudinal analysis to further support a potential causal association. So there was a twofold lower, in a twofold lower AMH decline over 10 years of follow-up time was associated with EDSS increase in those women, those 400 women we studied with MS. And that beta coefficient was 0.079, and it was highly statistically significant. 
to try to corroborate those findings with the EDSS, we also looked at AMH levels with gray matter volume. And in the top bullet point, we have the cross-sectional and the bottom longitudinal analysis. So in the baseline analysis, a twofold modest decrease in AMH over time was associated with a clinically relevant lower cortical gray matter volume, and it was statistically significant. The results for total gray matter and total volume were also notable but didn't quite reach statistical significance. Similarly, in the longitudinal analysis, a twofold decrease in anti malarian hormone was associated with clinically relevant decreases over that 10-year follow-up time of those 400 women um, with total gray matter volume and cortical gray matter volume, but didn't quite reach nominal statistical significance. So it's also really important to understand if this is being driven because anti-malarian hormone levels happen to be also associated with leukocyte telomere length. So here's some preliminary uh, results, a preliminary look to a critical question. And uh, we are, this is work in progress, uh, not yet published, um, but that we do see independent effects of anti-malarian hormone and LTH. So if I adjust these models for leukocyte telomere length, there's no significant attenuation of those coefficients I just shared with you. So in conclusion, lower anti-malarian hormone levels are associated with greater disability even after adjustment for chronological age, disease duration, and body mass index. Lower anti-malarian hormone levels are associated with lower cortical and total gray matter volumes, but not associated with T2 lesion volume. These results support the hypothesis that ovarian decline may be associated with accumulation of disability and secondary progressive MS risk in women. There are small trials ongoing examining estrogen receptor agonists, but estrogen, I think, is unlikely to be the only factor um, in the perimenopausal associations. Uh, brief mention of testosterone. There isn't as much of a precipitous decline in testosterone for men with MS as there is in the perimenopausal women for sex steroid hormones. But testosterone does decline 1% per year in men starting in the 30s, and higher rates of decline indicate hypogonadism. Hypogonadism has been associated with higher risk of getting MS for men, and some prior work largely led by the UCLA group, Dr. Voskel, and in some of the early work also Dr. Sycott, indicates that low testosterone may be associated with more brain tissue loss in men and male animal models. What can we tell our patients now? Well, one fountain of youth, um, one of the few things Elizabeth Blackburn has found after many years since her Nobel Prize in studying leukocyte telomere length that actually lengthens and restores telomere length is exercise and healthy diet and lifestyle and avoiding toxins like smoking. Also avoiding comorbidities like hypertension, diabetes, and heart disease, and continuing to study biological aging, both at the translational level and considering this in the design of our clinical trials. We may not need a full-blown fountain of youth, but we need to identify the key players in aging in the peripheral immune compartment as well as in resident uh, CNS environments that could change MS phenotype and may be key for allowing medications that target progressive MS to work. In summary, it's important to understand development and aging processes contribution to phenotype. Studying changes in MS throughout the life cycle may allow for more specific treatment strategies and new drug targets. The very young have highly inflammatory phenotypes and never, I'll say never or almost never, uh, present with progressive MS. Shorter leukocyte telomere length is associated with disability progression in MS, explains 15% of the effective chronological age on MS disability level. And while leukocyte telomere length is a marker of somatic aging, reproductive aging may in an independent pathway contribute to MS phenotype. As an example, declines in plasma anti-malarian hormone level are associated with disability progression in women with MS. Excessive telomere attrition drives the DNA damage response and the downstream senescence pathways that could be contributing to MS phenotype. Many people to acknowledge in this work, both in my new scientific home at UC San Diego and my colleagues at UCSF who participated in the EPIC study and the telomere work, uh, thanks to uh, Julin in the Blackburn lab who performed the telomere assays, Gerilyn um, Maserlin who performed the AMH assays, assays, and of course, our funders for the work. Thank you very much for your attention. I'll be happy to answer questions in the live Q&A coming up. You can also email me. And again, I hope you enjoy um, your meeting in London and hope next time I'll be able to join you in person. Thank you.